Good afternoon, my name is uh, Captain Tim O'Keefe. I'm a uh, UH-1 Yankee pilot with HMLA 367. We're based out of uh, Kaneohe, Hawaii. Uh, next to me is the UH-1 Yankee Huey helicopter, uh, also uh, otherwise uh, known as the Venom. Uh, with that, you can see uh, we've got two pilots up in the front and then we uh, normally will have uh, two crew chiefs in the back. Brief history of the helicopter, introduced in the 1960s, utilized extensively during the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, after the war, uh, initially it was a, a single engine aircraft. Uh, the Marine Corps wanted to have a navalized version, so they developed a, a twin engine aircraft, which became known as the UH-1 November. That allowed, uh, while you're working at sea, if you had an engine failure, that uh, you would still have that good engine to be able to make it back to the boat, which is uh, what we call the, uh, the ship, but the uh, Navy guys don't necessarily like us calling it the boat. Uh, so that, uh, that served from uh, roughly 1972 until uh, the uh, past few years, uh, at which point the uh, Marine Corps uh, in the early 2000s uh, started the uh, process to develop a uh, upgrade to that. Working with uh, Bell Helicopter, they developed the uh, UH-1 uh, Yankee helicopter that we see here, and that was uh, introduced in the, uh, the late 2000s, and we've been phasing that into service uh, since. Uh, so uh, big differences between the November and the, uh, the Yankee. As you can see here, there's four blades, so it's a, uh, a rigid four-bladed system uh, designed to uh, withstand combat damage. Uh, the November itself had two blades, so uh, with that we've got a uh, reduced uh, vibrations on the system and uh, faster control inputs and uh, response times from, uh, from pilot control inputs. Around the, uh, the aircraft itself, uh, again, as you can kind of see along the side here, uh, as we go through, we've got the uh, enlarged uh, cabin from the, uh, the November. Uh, inside the cabin itself, it can be uh, reconfigurable for uh, multiple mission sets. Uh, right here, you can see there's a uh, crash resistant seat that are inside of it, so uh, if there were a, a crash, they would actually uh, go down into the cabin, reducing injury for uh, personnel that are inside those seats. Uh, those can be moved out. Uh, other uh, features you can see in here, uh, here on the, uh, the left side is a, a fast rope gantry. Come down from here would be a, a fast rope itself, so uh, we can attach or detach those within the cabin, allowing for uh, quick departure of personnel from the, uh, the aircraft. It can also be used for repelling operations. Uh, we have done uh, Parachute operations, so uh, halo uh, operations or halo operations out, the, out of the, uh, the aircraft, helo cast operations, so uh, as we get low over the water and we can have personnel uh, with scuba or dive equipment getting off the aircraft uh, at the low altitude to then uh, swim into shore from, uh, from there. On the ground here you can see uh, there's a uh, pendant. Uh, underneath the aircraft itself there's a hook for the pendant and then a uh, screenshot here to the left is uh, the Huey in action uh, in Hawaii doing uh, external operations. Again, you can see the, uh, the versatility of the aircraft, uh, being able to both uh, move cargo and personnel uh, internally or externally to the, uh, to the aircraft into and out of the objective area. Another thing that we can do is a command and control mission. So the, uh, the aircraft has three radios. Uh, we can allow the ground force commander uh, to sit in the back of the aircraft. We can look forward uh, towards our uh, utilizing our forward looking infrared flare. It also has a, a CCTV that we can utilize uh, daytime. Uh, so utilizing that radio, bringing uh, other radios on board, uh, and utilizing our, our systems, uh, he can have a, a greater enhanced view of what's going on inside the objective area. Also you can see on the other side here, very open space, so he's able to look outside the aircraft, get a good idea of what's going on, and uh, direct the crew as, uh, as he needs to to move around the, uh, the objective area. So with uh, assault support, close air support uh, is another uh, kind of bread and butter mission of the HMLA. So here you've got the uh, Lao 68, the uh, seven shot rocket pod, and then right here where this placard is, is where we would be uh, mounting machine guns. Uh, up here you can see the GAL 21, it's a 50 caliber machine gun, and then down here is the uh, GAL 17, which is a uh, 7.62 uh, millimeter machine gun. The rate of fire for this is about uh, 3,000 rounds per minute. And then uh, we're looking at 950 to 1100 for the, uh, the GAU-21. Max range, uh, effective range is looking at uh, 1,850 meters and then uh, roughly 1100 meters for the, uh, the GAU-17. So with that, you've got uh, some long range punch and then uh, close in suppressive fire from the, uh, the GAU-17. The, uh, the rocket pod itself can uh, employ a number of different types of rockets, looking at uh, high explosive, flechette, illumination. 
We can also use uh, practice rounds and then uh, white phosphor rounds for, uh, for marking targets. Uh, with that, another mission set that we can do is a forward air controller airborne. So you can move into an objective area with the, uh, the aircraft and then the aircraft commander can utilize other air assets in the objective area to uh, engage targets. Uh, then uh, the white phosphorus is a very good uh, marking object that can be seen both by a helicopter at low altitude or jets that are at a higher altitude. Inside the cockpit itself, uh, two pilots, uh, it can be interchangeable with regards to the controls, so either we can pass controls fluidly between both of those. We've got redundant systems with regards to both pilots having a collective cyclic and uh, pedals. We have a uh, set of two multifunction displays for, uh, for both pilots, uh, which we can then select different pages that we can utilize uh, within, the, uh, within the cockpit, looking at uh, systems, et cetera, switching between those, uh, those different uh, modes, depending on what you're doing. So uh, the flying pilot will be focused more on operating the aircraft and flying the aircraft, um, and then the non-flying pilot will be able to uh, utilize the sensor, uh, utilize uh, the other systems to uh, keep the SA or situational awareness of the, the crew or the section high, and then uh, continue to uh, execute the mission within the objective area. Other uh, parts in there, again, we've got a uh, keypad. We're able to input stuff into the, uh, the MFDs, uh, then uh, our radio controls, and uh, standard circuit breakers uh, for, uh, for an aircraft. So with the, uh, the modern uh, environment that we operate in, there's a number of threats that are out there, uh, both IR and uh, radar guided. So with that, uh, aircraft operating the, uh, the modern uh, threat environment need to uh, utilize uh, spy rule equipment and tactics to make sure that they uh, stay uh, safe while operating. Uh, with that, we've got a, a survivability suite that includes uh, radar and uh, missile detectors, and then uh, we also have uh, the ability to put chaff and flares uh, to uh, mitigate uh, missiles that are shot fired at the, uh, the aircraft. That kind of talks through a lot of the, uh, the basics on the, uh, the aircraft itself. We start looking at uh, airspeeds, our uh, VNE is uh, 170 knots. We uh, look to normally transit between 120, 130 knots when we're pushing into and out of, a, out of an area. We're looking at uh, loiter times between two and three hours, depending on uh, our, uh, our mission, uh, what we need to do, uh, and then uh, with regard to burn rates on the aircraft. So uh, very easy for us to tailor our mission set based on uh, what the ground force commander wants. So in the end, uh, what we do is support the, uh, the ground element. Uh, so we're looking at them as our customer, and uh, we shape our mission set, our mission laid out for what uh, they need to do to accomplish their mission. So a number of other things that are very unique about the uh, UH-1 Yankee is a uh, Americanized aircraft. So with that, we're, uh, we're looking to utilize that in a uh, naval environment. The Marine Corps is uh, the unique organization that uh, it operates primarily off of uh, naval vessels. So uh, with that, on the other side of the aircraft here, I'll show you a picture of the uh, UH-1 Yankee operating off of naval shipping. The sea is, uh, okay, has a large salt content in the water, and salt is very bad for metal. So uh, one of the constant problems we have to deal with is corrosion on the aircraft. Uh, when we look at readiness rates, we have to have maintainers that are focused on ensuring that the, uh, there's a constant effort to make sure that the aircraft are in uh, good shape to uh, operate. When we're looking at the aircraft operating off the ship. picture of it here operating daytime. Uh, it can operate daytime or nighttime. We have a MG uh, capable cockpit. Uh, with that, you see here, uh, there's not necessarily a lot of space that we're operating on, on a ship. So there's not a lot of room for error when we're landing on a spot. And it requires a great deal of training to execute something that is rather benign in nature, which is just taking off and landing onto a spot. But landing on a ship is much different than landing on just a, a runway or a uh, dirt strip somewhere. You're going to have the deck that's going to be pitching up and down, left and right. Uh, then you're going to have multiple other aircraft that are going to be very close to the, uh, the aircraft that's landing onto the spot. So you're going to be utilizing a great deal of teamwork, what we call a CRM, a crew resource management, to ensure that we land the aircraft safely on deck after we completed a mission. Another part that uh, distinguishes us from a number of other aircraft and uh, is an indicator of our maritime nature is our blade system. 
we can fold our blades so that we can put the aircraft onto what we call the slash, which is part of the, uh, the flight deck where we put all the aircraft when they're not getting ready to fly. This frees up deck space for other aircraft to be put on the spot to then be able to take off and operate from the ship. UH-1 Yankee has operated in combat environments. Uh, here is a picture of it operating in uh, Afghanistan. With that, uh, we've taken over the mission of the, uh, the November, which was, at that point in time, I've been working from our initial operations in Afghanistan uh, through 2009. Then the uh, UE, the Yankee, started taking over at that point, operating in the confines of the, uh, the HMLA, uh, working together with the uh, AH-1 Whiskey. So with the, uh, the HMLA, we have two types of aircraft that we operate, the AH-1 Whiskey and the uh, UH-1 Yankee. We, have, we are transitioning the Whiskey to the AH-1Z. That will be an aircraft that the Incorporated just like the UH-1 Yankee, they're going to have uh, an immense amount of commonality of parts and equipment and uh, electronics between the two aircraft. When you're looking at the, uh, the UH-1 Yankee and the H-1 Zulu, they're going to have a common blade system, transmission, and drive shaft going through uh, the back of the aircraft. Up in the front, they're going to have common displays, common MFDs, and then common uh, internal avionics components. That allows for uh, It allows for us to be able to uh, have ease of maintenance between the two aircraft. We'll have maintainers that will be able to operate on both the uh, UH-1 Yankee and the AH-1 Zulu without having to worry about going and learning two different types of aircraft. So it allows us to focus on having maintainers that can uh, operate on both aircraft and uh, reduces the amount of school time we need to have to, uh, to train those planes. It also reduces the amount of components we need to have in the, uh, the supply system, which uh, increases our ability to have parts available to uh, perform maintenance on the aircraft itself.